everyone, and thank you for being here. So <clears throat> what I would like to do uh, tonight is to uh, present new concepts that are uh, progressively emerging on the larger halothermal system, uh, which we call metasomatic iron and alkali calcic halothermal system. Uh, these systems have uh, economic significance because they can host IUCG deposits. But now what we are starting to realize is that in addition to IUCG deposit, they can host a wide diversity of other critical and precious metal deposits as well. Uh, the work that I will be presenting tonight, it's done uh, in collaboration. Recording uh, in progress. With uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, collaborators from uh, uh, the Geological Survey of Canada, Louis Corriveau and Eric Potter, uh, the BRGM uh, from France, uh, Olivier Blain, and also uh, from SOCHEM, uh, Anthony de Tuni. I would like first to uh, acknowledge uh, all the collaborators that are uh, uh, which which would I'm working on this research, and particularly I would like to acknowledge uh, the leadership and the vision of Louise uh, from the Geological Survey of Canada, which has been working very hard and tireless, tirelessly on uh, these uh, metasomatic system, and now it's really uh, proving to make a difference on our understanding of these uh, hydrothermal system. Uh, I, will, I would also like to do uh, some publicity. Uh, so a lot of uh, the uh, concepts uh, that are going to be uh, presented tonight, uh, they will be uh, uh, presented as well in the uh, new special volume from the GAC that is likely going to be published this fall. So a lot of the uh, new concepts that I'm going to be discussing tonight, uh, if you uh, want to uh, go uh, further into those, uh, a lot of those are going to be uh, in the uh, new contributions that will be in the special edition of the uh, GAC. I also apologize that it's been a while since I've been discussing or presenting about this. So it's possible that I'm a bit rusty, but I'll try to do uh, as best as I can. Uh, so why uh, metasomatic iron and alkali, alkali calcic alteration system? And why do we prefer uh, that to uh, other alternative like uh, <clears throat> IUCG system? Uh, one of the first reason it's because what we think is that uh, not putting IUCG at, at the forefront of the name of the system it's better encompassing uh, the wide diversity of mineralization, but also deposit types that are possible uh, in these systems. And also this is really uh, reflecting part of the uh, metasomatic reaction uh, from which uh, these uh, large halothermal systems are formed. So we use uh, different uh, elements or groups of elements uh, in order to name these uh, hydrothermal system. One of them is iron. Uh, iron is uh, ubiquitous uh, in the formation of these systems. Uh, they are known to form large zones of iron uh, enrichment in the crust. And then what is also important is that uh, these uh, iron enrichment are not necessarily just forming iron oxides uh, like magnetite and hematite, but also these iron enrichment can be uh, manifested by uh, the formation and extensive formation of iron sulfide, iron silicates, and uh, iron carbonate. And this has implications as well uh, for uh, some vectoring tools or from some targeting tools that I, I, I will be uh, discussing a little bit light, later. Uh, then there's the uh, other components of these large metasomatic system, uh, the large zones of alkali alteration, especially the uh, corridors of the acidic alterations that are also ubiquitous uh, within the system, extending over tens of kilometers. And that will lead to the formation of uh, albitides, uh, so complete leaching of the host rock, and then the rest type will be an albitide. And also zone uh, which have strong potassic, but also potassic with iron or potassic with calcium uh, alteration assemblages. And then calcic as well, because uh, calcic alteration is uh, very important uh, during the formation of these systems. And this uh, calcium will combine itself with different other elements like iron, uh, potassium iron, <coughs> to form large zones of metasomatic alteration. Uh, it's also a very important to understand uh, that these uh, hydrothermal systems are extending, are very large. Uh, generally, they cover hundreds uh, to thousands of kilometers along a specific geological province. And it's really uh, driven uh, by the uh, physical chemical evolution of a very large fluid plumes. Uh, this plume uh, is evolving specially and with time. And uh, there's multiple sources that are contributing fluids uh, to, this, uh, to this very large uh, volume, uh, plume uh, that evolves in the crust. And also as it is evolving, it's gonna also interact 
with the other host trucks that are present within the geological province and will variably leach uh, some components of that drug sequence as well. Uh, there's also uh, very large heat drivers. Uh, these metasomatic, metasomatic systems are large because uh, part of the heat driver is very large as well. And it's generally, uh, special, especially, uh, it's proximal to distal to the evolution of a large batholith. Uh, and then these batholiths are going to have uh, multiple magma chambers in a continental settings. And the intrusions uh, that are forming the batholith are going to vary in composition and provide with different pulse, uh, different uh, hydrothermal fluids to the compositionally involving uh, fluid plume. Uh, they're also formed uh, in geodynamic settings that are evolving, so they're not constant. And generally, the transition between stress regimes seems to be a good place uh, to find uh, zones of significant mineralization. And then within these large hydrothermal systems that are extending over hundreds uh, to thousands of kilometers, there's going to be more discrete uh, districts where uh, deposits, uh, mineral deposits that can have very diversified uh, metal assemblages and showings are going to cluster. Uh, so in general, when there is one, uh, there's uh, in others uh, in the vicinity. And really, uh, <clears throat> what we can picture that as is that uh, we have a very large uh, fluid plume. It's going to interact with the rocks. It's going to completely transform the composition of the rock. Uh, the fluids are going to bring their own component to the system. They're going to interact with the rocks, leave with some component. And the suites of metasomatic reaction will keep going and keep going uh, as the fluid is progressing along the main fluid pathway, uh, pathways uh, inside the district. Uh, <clears throat> alteration in the system, it's uh, very intense. Uh, whole structure textures are very often completely annihilated uh, in zones of intense alteration, and it can become very difficult uh, to recognize uh, protholith. Uh, uh, for example, here, uh, this is an andesite uh, in uh, the Great Bear Magmatic Zone in northern Canada. And then as this andesite is getting progressively altered by the fluids, uh, what we can see is that the texture of this uh, uh, volcanic rock is progressively obliterated to the point uh, when the re replacement and alteration is complete, that this andesite has completely recrystallized, re uh, recrystallized uh, under uh, this very strong metasomatic replacement. So what we have to picture that as well is that these systems are, are very strong in terms of uh, their impact on the rocks with which they are interacting. <clears throat> Now, something important and something that we need to, to discuss is that IUCG deposits are formed uh, within these hydrothermal systems. But IUCG deposit has a very uh, specific meaning, and I think this is important to understand and to keep that meaning as, as we're talking about uh, these, uh, this type of mineralization. So in order to have an IUCG deposit and in order to speak of IUCG mineralization itself, uh, certain parameters uh, needs to be uh, met. For example, uh, copper uh, needs to be uh, the main metal uh, in mineral resources or in the assemblage of metals that are characteristic of that zone of mineralization. And then it can have subsidiary gold, silver, or other metals, but copper really needs to be uh, the, the, the most significant one. Uh, they are hydrothermal, and then they're structurally controlled. And another important aspect of that is that they need uh, a high percentage of iron oxides in association, uh, so specially associated with uh, mineralization. So in this case, we have a magnetite group, IUCG mineralization, and then associated with the deposition of calcopyrite, we have uh, intensive precipitation of magnetite variably associated with carbonates. And in general, uh, IUCG mineralization will be hosted in much larger zone of alkali and alkali calcic alteration, so zone of sodic alteration or zone of sodium calcium alteration. Uh, so this is really what IUCG mineralization is. And when we discuss uh, IUCG mineralization within the system, this is what we should be referring to. So something that has copper as the main metal, uh, something that is hydrothermal and structurally controlled and has a high percentage of iron oxides. And some part of the confusion that is inherent to some of these hydrothermal systems is that name IUCG has been transposed to a lot of the other mineralization type that are existing within these systems, but are not meeting uh, the definition of what is actually IUCG mineralization. And then once we have IUCG mineralization, then it's generally defining two main members. So we have magnetite groups uh, in which magnetite is going to be the main iron oxides. 
so one example here, it's from the uh, Ernest Henry deposit in Australia, and then hematite group. Uh, so hematite group in which hematite is going to be the main iron oxide. And then the example here from Olympic Dam, with which, which is probably the archetype uh, hematite group IUCG deposit also uh, located in Australia. <clears throat> But now, in addition to IUCG mineralization, we need to, uh, there's many, many others uh, mineralization types that are possible within these uh, uh, hydrothermal system. And what we have now is that we, ha we have established a framework and a chart that is enabling us to understand better uh, what is the significance of each of these mineralization styles, uh, how they relate to the evolution of the system, and what do they mean uh, in terms of where we are specially or where, what it means in terms of exploration potential if we are to work uh, with, with these metasomatic systems. Um, and what is driving uh, this uh, metal diversity uh, in uh, these hydrothermal system? It's really because we have the polyphase development of uh, multiple alteration fasces. And then each of these alteration fasces will come with their own distinct metal enrichment. Uh, some of them may not have metals, uh, like the sodic alteration stage, but most of the others will come with a, a certain contribution to the uh, metal endowment of these, uh, of these systems. Uh, something as well that it's important to understand is that we can concentrate uh, at variable intensity almost every element of the periodic table. Uh, so uh, the enrichments that are happening within these systems are, are quite spectacular in some cases and, and can be uh, very diversified, diversified in terms of what gets concentrated and which zones of uh, mineralization. And when we look at IUCG mineralization, so the two main elements that were used to uh, define uh, very often what these systems are, they're actually one of the uh, multiple components that exist uh, in resources of mineral deposits that are formed within these hydrothermal systems. So copper and gold are actually uh, coming with many, many other metals. And then there's also uh, a lot of other metals that may have uh, economic potential in the future, uh, depending on how, uh, how the price of metals and uh, how the resource like uh, are evolving. Uh, something else as well to, uh, that is important is that very often uh, iron rich alteration fasces will be uh, associated uh, with mineralization in many of these systems, but the expression in the rock of that iron rich alteration can be quite variable. And the variability of the expression of iron rich alteration may, al may also have contributed to some of the difficulties of recognizing uh, the af af affinity uh, between certain mineralization styles that are formed within these systems. Uh, Sometimes it's going to come with iron oxides, but uh, in many other cases, it's going to come with iron sulfides, so either pyrite or pyrite, iron silicate, so it can be amphibole, biotite, uh, chlorite. And then carbonates, so it can be iron carbonates like siderites, which are becoming the main expression of this iron rich alteration that is characteristic of these systems. And now, what is emerging as well is that in certain zones of these uh, metasomatic iron and alkali, alkali calcic system, uh, there are uh, zones of uh, iron poor mineralization that are decoupled from the iron rich alteration fasces. But the formation of these, this iron poor mineralization is still associated with the formation of the system. So what this uh, relatively complex uh, figure uh, is illustrating, it's illustrating uh, first, uh, what are the characteristic alteration fasces that are existing uh, within these uh, hydrothermal system, going from the early stage uh, to the late stage. Uh, then what are the characteristic mineral assemblages that are present uh, within each of these alteration fasces? Uh, what style of mineralization can we expect uh, with each of these uh, fasces of alteration? Which metals can be concentrated? And then example of non-mineralization that relates to each of these, uh, these fasces of alteration. And now in, in the following slide of the presentation, what we'll do is that we'll start uh, from the acidic alteration stage and we'll go to the iron pore uh, uh, stage of alteration, and then we'll look at different style of mineralizations that are existing uh, within the system, and we'll also be including uh, some example from the uh, southern province for our SPG property as well, as we move up, and we look at the variability of mineralization and alteration that exists uh, in metasomatic iron and alkali calcic uh, system. Uh, 
Uh, this will be published in the uh, special publication of the GAC that's going to be coming out uh, this fall. Um, and slight enlargement as well. Uh, so the next two slides will just be enlargement uh, to help uh, see better uh, what are the main components as well of, of this figure. So if we move to the uh, first stage, uh, sodic alteration. Uh, so what sodic alteration is? Uh, sodic alteration is the very intense replacement and complete transformation of any type of whole strut into albitides. So we can take a bedded uh, sedimentary rock that shows nice bedding uh, compositionally, uh, biotite, magnetite uh, in certain beds and other beds are more felsic. And then we take that rock and we completely obliterate its primary textures and we transform that into an albitite where any primary mineral is completely replaced by an assemblage made of albite and quartz. Uh, these rocks, they can contain up to 12% NaTO and it's quite intense. I can hear you. Replace it. So looking at the mineralogical process of sodic alteration, uh, so we take all the minerals that are forming initial rocks and then we completely leach and destroy uh, these rocks in order to replace them by albitite. So what we can see as an albitite, it's somewhat of a respite of an extensive leaching process that, are, that is happening early in the formation and the evolution of these large hydrothermal systems. Uh, any elements uh, within uh, sodic alteration can be variably mobile, but there are certain elements that are, can be left behind and, and then they can be relatively enriched in zone of sodic alteration. Example of those include zircons, uh, tantalum, and niobium minerals uh, in association with titanium oxide, and sometimes uh, phosphates uh, can stay somewhat behind. But still, uh, this sodic alteration is able in certain condition to mobilize almost every element on the periodic table uh, to a certain extent. Um, something else that is important uh, with the formation of sodic alteration, and this may also play a role later on, uh, with uh, where zones of mineralization are going to be formed in later stage of the system, is when you're albitizing something, uh, it's primarily uh, progressing by dissolution representation of the whole strike. Uh, what this process is leaving behind, it's leaving behind a, a network of porosity uh, within the albitite. And something that we can observe after is that these porous albitites may become mechanically weakened. And if you superimpose uh, deformation over these zones of albitite, uh, these can start breaking first uh, in comparison to the surrounding whole strike. Uh, the images on the, uh, on the right here and underneath, what they represent is they represent rocks that we put into a, a CAT scan, a medical scanner. And then what they show is that they show the preferential breakage of the, these layers that are actually albitized, whereas the beds uh, in the sedimentary units that were not albitized are not breaking as much as the other bed. And then this partially control the emplacement of the uh, albitite also during a mineralization that gets superimposed over these zones of albitization. So in here, we can illustrate uh, how this uh, uh, preferential partitioning of brecciation happens uh, in the albitites. And because sodic alteration is generally following major discontinuity in, in the geological province where these systems are being formed, then in the later stage, as the system is evolving and deformation may get more intense, uh, these zones and these corridors of albitites may become the first one to break and then become favorable host uh, for mineralization. Uh, something else as well. Uh, so we, we say that uh, sodic alteration uh, sometimes leaves some elements behind. Uh, if we try to recognize rocks, or if we try to recognize protolith, and then we use uh, in situ methods like uh, portable XRF uh, in order to say or to identify a whole strike using zirconium titanium ratio or, or other ratioing that could work. Uh, and here, what this is showing is that uh, if we have this uh, substone uh, that uh, in here and we go in the beds that are not albitized, uh, this is a signal that's done by a, it's a, a continuous profile of XRF measurements uh, that is done along this slab of rock. What we can see is that elements like titanium uh, in zones that are not albitized, it's very homogeneous. Titanium is probably distributed in the iron oxides associated with that uh, biotite. But then as we get into the, the beds of uh, sodic alteration, what we see is that titanium becomes very, very uh, spiky. 
and then we come back into a least albitized bed and it comes back regular and then in albitized bed it becomes very very spiky again this is really illustrating well uh, the redistribution uh, at the local scale of these elements that are not completely mobilized as acidic alteration is progressing compared to potassium or uh, calcium and iron that are completely depleted as acidic alteration is happening elements like titanium or other discrete can form discrete zones of enrichment and then if we use uh, portable methods in order to identify this whole structure, well, we have to be aware that uh, our ratio will be consider considerably disrupted if we try to, to work uh, with the uh, portable XRF in this. At the small scale as well, this is what it looks like. So then we can start concentrating relatively these elements that are staying behind and from enrichment or so relative enrichment in uh, niobium and tantalum as we're strongly advertising uh, a rock. Uh, uh, for the southern province, uh, these concepts are important uh, because the southern province, obviously, uh, there is a very intense albitization that is extending over a significant strike length. And very often what we are observing in the uh, southern province is that uh, mineralization will be overprinting uh, zones of static alteration. There is a special relationship because static alteration is helping us to map the main fluid pathways, but then these zones of static alteration, they become preferential zone for reactivation and brecciation, and then the mineralizing fluids will overprint these zones of uh, static alteration. And we have a different example of static alteration that exists uh, within the southern province and different units of the Euronian supergroup. It's uh, likely going into the nipissing cells as well, uh, where the nipissing cells can get considerably albitized. And then they can reach concentration with up to 10% uh, any tool in these zones of albitization. So quite intense uh, uh, static alteration happening in the southern province. Uh, as the fluid is evolving and the system is evolving as well, uh, then we start leaving uh, the zone of static alteration. And then we're going into, especially where there are a lot of carbonates, into uh, and our fasces transitional between fasces 1 and fasces 2. So what is SCARN and iron SCARN assemblage? Um, so these can be uh, quite abundant in certain metasomatic iron and alkali calcic alteration system. And they can be important to recognize as well because they are signaling the evolution of the system. Uh, one thing that could give a clue uh, that SCARN alteration is actually related to these type of system. Uh, very often, uh, they're gonna be uh, surrounded uh, by zone of static alteration. So they're, they're going to be specially associated and commonly overprinting uh, with zones of static alteration. There is an example here. Uh, there is another example here of a static altered bed in a, in a, in a unit and it's uh, progressively brecciated and infiltrated by scarn like alteration. And they won't be specially associated with uh, intrusion. So heat uh, from the fluid is really going to be the main driver uh, for, for the formation of these uh, scarn assemblage. And as, this, as the system is evolving, uh, and then the iron-rich component of the fluid uh, and the system is getting in, then we're going to transition progressively to iron scarn uh, assemblage and then to the uh, high temperature calcic iron alteration. Uh, there's other examples here. So for example, here we have this uh, scarn assemblage. And then as the system is evolving, then we can start to see the formation of an uh, iron scarn assemblage where we have magnetite as a main iron oxide so coming in and then start replacing the early scarn. Uh, and here we have uh, beds that are sodically altered and then other beds that are transformed uh, into scarn like assemblages. Uh, in terms of minerals, uh, very typical scarn assemblage, so clanoperoxine, garnet, and then subsidiary amphibole, magnetite, apatite, and some uh, relics of the uh, carbonates that were present into the carbonate rich beds. Uh, there's possible mineralization as well, and that mineralization can get uh, significant in certain contexts. Uh, so magnetite uh, in those uh, systems and the F F iron scan alteration can form uh, large iron deposits. Uh, there's a good example of that in uh, China. And then uh, scheelite, uh, so tungsten, uh, can precipitate as well as the system is going through the uh, scan alteration stage. And there is example of that in the Nico deposit that shows uh, a relatively pervasive uh, tungsten enrichment in certain zones of, of the deposits that are after overprinted by the next uh, alteration fascist. So sometimes if this alteration gets to a, a, sing, a significant intensity, uh, we could potentially see uh, the formation of a tungsten deposit as the uh, hydrothermal system goes through this current stage of alteration. As the system 
keeps evolving. Uh, this is when uh, it's going to reach uh, close to its uh, thermal peak. Uh, so the high temperature calcic iron uh, alteration fasces and the iron scan in certain contexts are going to be where the, these uh, metasomatic systems are reaching their highest uh, temperature. And in this case, it's going to be characterized by extensive zone of uh, calcium iron alteration uh, and where the main minerals are going to be amphibole and magnetite, and in certain cases, magnetite with apatite and amphibole. Uh, this is an example here of this alteration fasces uh, in the southern province from the uh, SPG property, where we have amphibole and magnetite, showing that in the southern province, uh, we could find uh, evidence that there was a zone of higher temperature alteration that exists and that are still preserved uh, uh, in the rocks. So typical minerals of what we have, uh, amphibole, magnetite, apatite can become uh, quite significant in certain of these alteration zones. Epidote, uh, titanite uh, can become a very important accessory phase. And then we can have variable relics and garnet, especially if this alteration overprints uh, earlier scan alteration. And this is a good example of this uh, evolution near the uh, Nico deposit uh, in Northwest Territories where we have the early scan alteration, and then the scan is overprinted by amphibole and magnetite assemblage. And then what this alteration will do is it's going to form veins that can be discordant, but also can start doing selective replacement as well along certain beds, and will variably overprint the earlier scan paragenesis that was present there. In terms of uh, mineralization that can happen uh, at this high temperature calcic iron alteration stage, uh, one that is uh, very significant is the formation of what we call the iron oxide uh, with or without appetite deposits. Uh, these can form massive iron oxide deposits. Uh, Kiruna uh, would be a good example of one of those type of deposits. And then in which uh, the main uh, mineralization mineral will be magnetite. Uh, in certain zones of iron oxide appetite uh, mineralization, especially when uh, potassic alteration is present uh, inside the system, and the appetite can become uh, quite enriched uh, in rare earths, and then we can start to see uh, the formation of rare earths mineralization uh, in association with the precipitation of magnetite. And also, as in certain cases, uh, magnetite is going to have a, a good component of vanadium inside its crystalline structure, and it can form a concentration of vanadium in association with this uh, high temperature calcic iron alteration. Uh, something else as, that is emerging now uh, at this alteration fasces is that we can have a, a significant nickel mineralization at this stage. Uh, this is new. This is emerging from the uh, Brazilian IUCG districts. And we are observing uh, that now repeating itself more and more, uh, the formation of nickel uh, mineralization. This is a good question. Uh, the transition uh, between mold and salt and uh, fluids, that's potentially what's affecting uh, deposits uh, like Kiruna. So they're kind of sitting at the boundary between metasomatic process and magmatic process. Uh, that's potentially one of the explanations. Uh, we could go further in detail if you want, uh, maybe later. Maybe, maybe read the, uh, I'm just going to read the questions, though. Maybe some, some people have missed it in the, in the chat. But uh, yeah, Dan was asking, uh, how can we explain the immiscible, uh, immiscible like textures in Karuna <clears throat> with appetite by replacement? Yeah. Well, yeah, continue, JF. And then maybe at the end, we can, we can get back to this. Yeah. Yeah, we have, we have some example here also of appetite uh, stable with these uh, magnetite paragenesis as well. Uh, this is an example from uh, the iron oxide rich and also uh, rare and rich mineralization in North Northwest Territories that is forming the uh, Port Iridium Prospect uh, and the, uh, in the Great Bear Magmatic Zone. So we have these veins of magnetite in association with amphibole uh, that are coming with appetite. And then this appetite will have rare within this crystalline structure. And this can enrich uh, rare earths at this stage. Now, in order to form significant rare earth mineralization, what we are observing is that this early appetite uh, needs to be uh, remobilized, dissolved, and re precipitated by superimposed fluids. And in deposits like the uh, Josette or Crujibo deposit in Quebec, 
this is what is being observed. So there's an early stage of iron oxide alteration that comes with appetite, and this appetite is variably enriched in rare earths. And then there's a later stage of remobilization of these uh, rare earths from the appetite that are represented in new phase of iron oxide rich alteration uh, with garnets. Uh, and this is forming uh, relatively high grade rare earth resources in association with this uh, alteration fashion. So this is a nice example of the early uh, stage of that mineralization. And then once it gets remobilized, it can get to very interesting uh, rare earth grades and form uh, uh, rare earth deposits. Uh, and the Kujibo deposit in Canada uh, is, uh, is an example of those that we have. Now, uh, iron oxide to iron sulfide uh, nickel mineralization. Uh, this is something that is emerging in the uh, Carajas district in Brazil. Uh, it starts to form a significant deposit. Uh, it's named the uh, Jaguar uh, nickel deposit. Uh, this, this is a resource number uh, in here. And this is associated with the evolution of the high temperature calcic iron alteration fascias. It's mineralization that is forming at temperature that was estimated at the Jaduba deposit, uh, slightly over uh, five, 500 degree uh, Celsius. And it's associated with the deposition contemporaneous with uh, magnetite or amphibole uh, of uh, nickel uh, bearing pyrite or, or pentlandite. And this is start to form a significant nickel mineralization. And uh, we observed that uh, in the southern province uh, a little bit uh, where we had this uh, intersection and that grade up to 18 person nickel, again associated with this high temperature calcic iron alteration fascist, but it doesn't reach uh, the intensity that is being observed yet uh, in Brazil. But it shows that this uh, process uh, could replicate itself in different uh, other uh, metasomatic iron and alkali calcic alteration systems as well. Uh, moving uh, in the evolution of the system, uh, temperature is progressively decreasing at this stage. And now we're moving into uh, the first uh, ingress of potassium uh, within uh, the, in the metasomatic iron and non calcic alteration system. Uh, so we're having uh, the fa transitional fasces between two and three, uh, which is the uh, calcium potassium iron, uh, transitioning to biophyte rich uh, potassium iron, and then to potassium iron alteration fasces. Uh, the high temperature potassium iron alteration fasces, which is the third one, is also the first one where we start to see a significant copper enrichment and for the first formation of uh, IUCG uh, mineralization uh, within this hydrothermal system. Whereas this uh, calcium potassium iron uh, fasces is more associated uh, with cobalt uh, rich mineralization. Uh, cobalt will, will be associated with other metals, but it's going to be one of the prevailing metal in, inside the mineralizing from these fashions. Uh, this also contrasts the uh, color, uh, the difference, the visual difference between uh, the two types of uh, alteration and mineralization. So if we go first uh, to the high temperature calcic uh, potassium iron, so we keep the amphibole, uh, but then these amphiboles are going to be associated with biotite uh, as a potassium mineral or a key feldspar. Magnetite can remain important. And then garnets and cyanoparoxene, uh, if this overprints earlier scan assemblages, they can be occurring as relics. Uh, one characteristic of that mineralization style as well is that arsenides and sulfarsenides are going to be a very important component uh, in association with mineralization. Uh, sulfides can be present as well, a uh, uh, wide diversity of sulfide, and uh, we also start to see uh, uranium coming in uh, in certain zones of mineralization at this stage. Uh, whereas when we move to the uh, high temperature potassium iron stage, uh, cave feldspar uh, become one of the prevailing phase that uh, can be associated with biophyte. Uh, magnetite will be present uh, in uh, variable abundance. Amphibole can be uh, somewhat present, but not as abundant as the uh, as within this uh, high temperature calcic iron potassium fasces. Uh, calcopyrite can become a very significant sulfide, native gold as well, but other uh, enrichment can happen as well. Uh, uraninite, uh, uranium will start to get enriched and in certain zones still show uh, enrichment in rare earths. So, so certain rare earth minerals can still precipitate uh, in association with the development of the high temperature potassium iron alteration. Uh, this is within the same deposit, so the nickel deposit, and this is to contrast the uh, IUCG, um, magnetite group IUCG uh, component inside nickel. So we can see here a uh, strong k feldspar alteration, uh, magnetite calcopyrite vein, uh, so very characteristic of IUCG mineralization. 
in comparison to the uh, cobalt bismuth gold mineralization uh, that is at the uh, calcium potassium iron alteration fascias. Amphibole with magnetite, uh, sulfire sunlight. Uh, so, very uh, different style of mineralization, but that can specially overlap within the same deposit. Uh, something important as well, and something that we start to observe, is that in certain cases, uh, this cobalt rich mineralization at this high temperature calcic potassium iron fascias. Uh, will be rich uh, or specially associated with iron oxides, but in certain zones of mineralization, uh, there won't be any iron oxides. Iron silicates uh, can be the main phase, so either uh, amphibole biophyte or biophyte, or in certain cases, iron sulfides uh, may become the main phase, and iron oxides uh, can be absent uh, from mineralization. So we have uh, three examples here, uh, one deposit, the Nico deposit uh, in Northwest Territories in Canada, uh, where we have uh, Relics of a assemblage were printed by the uh, calcium potassium iron alteration uh, assemblage. There it is. We have uh, the uh, iron silicate. Uh, an example, it's the, uh, the Blackbird uh, suite of deposits uh, in the Idaho Cobalt Belt in, uh, in the US. Uh, so in this case, there, is, there are zones of uh, significant iron oxide alteration, but cobalt and copper mineralization themselves are especially decoupled. Uh, so uh, they don't occur with strong iron oxide alteration, more with strong iron silicate alteration. And then in here, an example from the uh, Roman Eors in Quebec, uh, where cobalt is actually associated with uh, iron sulfide, uh, very strong iron sulfide and no iron oxides. And then the transition from iron silicate dominated to uh, iron sulfide dominated. Uh, this is important too when we're looking at the geophysical footprints of these deposits, because if Iron silicates are the main association uh, with mineralization. It means that something uh, like mag may not be able to detect instantly uh, where uh, mineralization is located uh, in comparison to nickel, uh, where there's a special overlap between iron oxides and uh, the zone of uh, cobalt uh, mineralization. So this is also important to understand that in certain cases, uh, iron oxides may not be specially associated uh, with uh, the deposition of metals. Uh, and other minerals will be uh, iron rich minerals will be associated and then this could change uh, some of the rectoring that we have to do uh, in order to uh, be efficient at finding those zones. Same with iron sulfide. So if there's a lot of iron sulfide, then we can start to have a nice conductor in association uh, with this tub here. Um, as we move to the uh, potassium, potassium iron alteration fasces, so fasces 3. Uh, Copper is not the only element that gets enriched uh, at this uh, alteration stage. Uh, we also have zones where instead of copper and, and with the development and association with the development of magnetite cemented breaches, uh, uranium uh, becomes uh, the main uh, element of interest, uh, forming zones of uh, albutite osted uranium mineralization that are uh, associated with the development of this uh, magnetite rich with variable pyrite uh, fasces of uh, alteration. And uh, with the uh, potassium component, which is illustrated by the rug becoming bright red like that. This, menu, this style uh, can be uh, relatively cryptic as well. Uh, there's an example here. Uh, so this rock, when you put a gamma ray spectrometer on it, contains over uh, 2000 ppm uranium equivalent. But uh, visually, it doesn't look like much. Uh, this also uh, indicates that uh, when we are working within these systems, uh, working with tools like gamma ray spectrometers can be quite important uh, to detect uh, some of these styles of mineralization, which visually uh, may not be uh, so obvious. Uh, this uh, can get to interesting uranium grade. Uh, this is a channel sample that uh, was collected, and it got up to 0.77% uh, 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 uranium in situ uh, within that zone where we can see uh, uraninite uh, distributed uh, within that sample. This is, again, uh, an image of the rock uh, using a, a CAT scan. And we can see uh, the distribution of uranium in association with the zones of sodic alteration and then where magnetite and iron oxides are becoming yeah, slightly more very abundant. interesting for me now. It's just to... And now this is moving to... Uh, uh, what is actually uh, Manning Magnetite Group ICG mineralization? I'm sorry, there's just a hidden animation here that I, I will remove. I can pick this one up. Uh, so Magnetite Group IUCG mineralization, uh, this is uh, what start forming as well at the uh, high temperature potassium iron alteration fasces, and then the formation of Magnetite Group IUCG mineralization continues to the transition to the uh, 
hematite stage of the uh, evolution of this hydrothermal system. A uh, different expression of that style of mineralization. So in here we have the uh, sudayan deposit where we can see the magnetite breccia uh, associated with strong potassium alteration of the fragments. Um, the Anderson redeposit, uh, this magnetite uh, with carbonates and then Kefelsvar alteration of the fragments. And then the, uh, the component inside the uh, nickel deposits where we have this vein of these veins of magnetite with pyrite, calcopyrite, and then again, the strong potassium uh, feldspar alteration around uh, these uh, magnetite calcopyrite veins. And this is overlying the nickel deposit. This is called the symmetry showing. And again, the same uh, assemblages associated with this magnetite group IUCG mineralization. Uh, something else as well is that we generally, uh, when we look for this, uh, this is obviously what we always want to find, but the uh, visual indicators uh, in the rocks, even just going 600 meters away uh, from the Sudarian deposit, uh, this is one of the first expression of that uh, high temperature calcic iron alteration. So a two centimeter long vein of magnetite that has potassium alteration halo. And that's one of the first uh, indication uh, that this alteration could exist uh, inside a system of interest. Uh, so it's important also to pay attention because if we do uh, regional traversing or prospecting, uh, the probabilities of finding this uh, may not be as, as high, but the probabilities of encountering this uh, could be uh, much higher, especially in areas where there is uh, not a lot of outcrop cover. So even these little signs can be important uh, to find uh, something like this. Uh, now going to uh, uh, transitional fasces uh, between uh, the high temperature like uh, potassium iron and then the low temperature potassium iron alteration stage. Uh, there's two things that can happen. Uh, there could be a slight influx of heat uh, within the system. In, a, in association with potassium, we can start to see the formation of a potassium current assemblage where clinoparoxine in association with uh, k feldspar can start forming. Uh, we can see somewhat of a uh, potassium feldspar flooding happening between those two zones and then forming zones that are going to be specially discrete and relatively brecciated as well of a uh, fail site. So zones that are completely replaced uh, by a feldspar to a significant extent. And then this brings us to the uh, low temperature fasces 5, uh, low temperature uh, potassium iron and calcium magnesium iron. Uh, once we reach uh, this fasces, uh, the system and the mineralization types that are possible are significantly increasing in terms of complexity. Uh, there's such a wide diversity of mineralization at this stage. It's, uh, it's quite interesting, but it's also getting uh, quite complex uh, as well. Uh, we'll start to cover uh, those that are associated with the uh, potassium iron component, and then we'll go to the uh, calcium magnesium iron component as well. Uh, example here from the uh, Mento Verde uh, IUCG deposit in, in Chile. So different minerals as well are uh, precipitating as in association with these uh, alteration fasces. So when we have the low temperature potassium iron, uh, potassium phases like feldspar uh, progressively evolving to muscovite uh, will be very important in the parogenesis. Uh, they will be associated with the uh, hematite, uh, more, more often specular hematite as well. Uh, a component of significant siderite will be, uh, is going to be present. Uh, fluorite can become very important. And then there can be uh, other carbonates as well. Uh, so anchorite, calcite, dolomite, uh, variably present. And then barite uh, become a very important component in these zones of uh, alteration. When we go to the uh, calcium magnesium iron, uh, plus or minus potassium alteration fasces, then it changes uh, minerals like chloride, epidote, Amphibole garnets uh, can become uh, the main iron bearing phases uh, within zones of these hydrothermal systems. And then the prevailing uh, iron rich mineral will also be uh, depending on the condition of, of the fluids. Uh, very often in oxidized conditions, uh, epidote is going to be quite important when it's more reduced, uh, chloride can become uh, more important. And when we start to see assemblages uh, composed of epidote uh, with uh, uh, key feldspar as uh, some hematite, uh, this could be uh, the equivalent of this uh, potassium iron alteration fasces, uh, but develop in more uh, mafic environment. Uh, so in this case, uh, there's some buffering uh, for the formation of iron oxides, and then epidote can assimilate a lot of the, uh, the iron, uh, crystallizing from the ferromagnesium mineral that were present. And then as the system is progressively saturating, then iron oxides can start to form as well. 
And then other minerals like even magnetite, they can be present in certain of these zones like feldspar and carbonates. Uh, quite a diversity of mineralization minerals that are possible at this uh, these alteration fasces. Uh, a wide diversity of sulfites, uh, native gold, uh, uranium, uh, rarites, especially light rarites, uh, as alanite, uh, rarite carbonates, and rarite phosphates. <coughs> uh, so, first example, and probably one of the most significant ones that happens at the uh, low temperature potassium iron alteration fasces is the formation of hematite group. IUCG mineralization, which has formed some of the largest uh, mineral deposits existing on the wall, uh, the Olympic Dam deposit, uh, which is uh, a very significant deposit uh, in Australia. Uh, two examples here, and uh, non the number of the resource. Uh, and then the uh, prominent hill deposit, which is also a significant deposit in the uh, Olympic uh, district in Australia. Something to point out, out though, that is uh, quite interesting and also reflect part of the complexity of these uh, system. Olympic Dam was discovered in 1975, and Prominent Hill uh, was the next discovery uh, in the Galler cartoon in 2001. So it took quite a bit of time uh, in order to make the second discovery after Olympic Dam uh, was discovered, even though uh, it's still a very significant large and large deposit. Um, the system may not be easy to exp explore, uh, very complex, and making discovery by uh, Kanti take time and the, the get time gap between the discovery of Olympic Dam and Prominent Hill seems to reflect that as well. Um, using uh, some uh, 10 sections from Prominent Hill, uh, it shows well uh, the variability and the sulfide assemblage that are characteristic of this hematite group uh, IUCG mineralization. Uh, the earlier uh, copper sulfide is generally calcopyrite. It's going to be variably associated with uh, sericite, uh, emethite, a component of uh, fluorite. And then uh, the second stage of uh, copper mineralization very often come with boronite and diginite uh, in association with variable barite, uh, sometimes very intense uh, fluorite uh, in association with uh, emetite. Uh, there will be uh, some residues of uh, white mica or sericite and also uh, coming with some quartz as well. And then in here, it's again the example from the uh, Mantoverde deposit in uh, Chile. Uh, something else that is interesting at the uh, low temperature potassium iron alteration fasces, uh, this is illustrated by the permanent hill mine, is that uh, we can have a significant copper uh, with subsidiary gold uh, mineralization uh, at this stage, but also uh, we have a transition uh, where copper has significantly decreased uh, in number and then gold uh, become the, the prevailing uh, metal uh, in, inside uh, some, some of these zones of uh, alteration. Uh, the formation of gold-rich mineralization uh, at this uh, uh, seems to be occurring as the system is transitioning uh, from uh, uh, zones that are uh, with little quartz to zone where quartz uh, becomes more abundant inside the mineral paragenesis. And then in this case, we don't have the formation of uh, sensu stricto IUCG, but we're getting into something that it's uh, gold-rich, so I, IUG uh, mineralization that, that we could call. Um, in certain uh, of these zones, uh, copper uh, may not be present. Uh, and instead of copper, as we have observed at the high temperature calcic iron alteration fasces, uh, uranium uh, will become uh, the main metal in association with the development of this uh, hematite uh, uh, sericite archifeldspar alteration. Uh, these are examples from the uh, central mineral belt uh, in Labrador in, in, in Canada. Uh, and then what we can see here is that we have albitite hosted uh, uranium mineralization. But in this case, and in contrast with the uh, Great Bear uh, magmatic zone where it was related to magnetite, in this case, uh, it's related to uh, the formation of specular emetite that's coming uh, with the uh, uranium mineralization. The rocks look very similar. It's the main iron oxide that is different in, in, in the instance. Uh, so this is another subtype of uh, mineralization that can be formed at this uh, low temperature potassium iron alteration fashions. Uh, in certain instance, uh, especially when there's a lot of graphite in the geological sequence, uh, in certain case, uh, the formation of iron oxide will be hindered and then iron sulfites uh, may become uh, the prevailing uh, iron rich mineral in association with the uh, copper mineralization. So this could be consider somewhat equivalent uh, to uh, hematite group IUCG mineralization, but in this case, 
instead of having a massive formation of hematite, we can have massive formation of pyrethite or pyrite. And then this is going to be associated with the copper mineralization. Uh, these, this style is also referred as uh, iron sulfide copper gold uh, mineralization. Uh, this is an example from uh, Delhi Pacific uh, in the Romane Horse uh, in Quebec, uh, where we have a pyrethite associated with uh, the formation of copper pyrite. And then, and then another member uh, in permanent hill, we had the iron oxide gold. Uh, in the case of the uh, scattering deposit, what we are observing is that the gold mineralization is associated with the strong iron silicate uh, alteration uh, expressed in this case by uh, chloride with variable sulfide. And then gold mineralization is directly associated, associated with the formation of that uh, iron rich chloride. Uh, going a little bit more on what is the characteristic geochemical trend uh, for the scattering deposit. So in general, we start with an albitite. Uh, there's an early stage of uh, carbonate alteration uh, that is overprinting the earlier acidic alteration. Uh, iron progressively gets in into the system. We can see here the carbonates are progressively getting rim uh, by uh, chloride. And then as peak iron alteration happens, then this is when peak gold mineralization happens in the scattering deposit. And then iron become one of the prevailing phase uh, in, in, in associated with the, the formation of this chloride. And once we look at, at drill core, we can see a very good special association uh, between the zones of iron enrichment and where gold is uh, deposited uh, in the system. Uh, to example, from two holes uh, the drilled inside the uh, scanning deposit. And then this is new, uh, and this is where the system again increases in complexity. Uh, this is one at fasces fi uh, five. Instead of having uh, iron rich alteration fasces, uh, we're getting into iron poor uh, alteration fasces, but still forming zone of uh, uh, strong mineralization. Uh, this is uh, this this type of mineralization start to emerge in many of the uh, metasomatic iron and alkali calcic district around the world. And, uh, and here I'm just going to be uh, presenting some example of that. Uh, one of them from the uh, Thick Hill deposit in Australia, uh, where we have zone of sodic alteration overprinted by uh, quartz and quartz carbonate associated with the deposition of gold. Uh, and on the SPJ property, uh, we have uh, veins of quartz, quartz carbonate associated with calcopyrite and a component of gold mineralization as well. Uh, there's also other styles of mineralization that are possible uh, with these iron pore uh, alteration fasces. Uh, a, a good example and uh, economically significant comes from the uh, Mudor uh, and Merlin deposit in Australia. Uh, the two deposits are adjacent to each other. So at Mudor, uh, copper uh, with uh, accessory uh, gold, lead, and zinc is associated with the formation of a carbonate tourmaline uh, style of alteration in which calcopyrite is associated or sphalerite is associated with that carbonate alteration, uh, rimming pyrite. And then the uh, Merlin deposit, uh, what it is, is that it's uh, a significant molybdenum deposit. It's a one of the highest grade molybdenum deposit. It's the highest grade molybdenum deposit in the world. And this is a uh, massive uh, precipitation of molybdenite in breccia, but also replacing uh, the uh, sedimentary rocks uh, especially adjacent to the uh, Mandor deposit. Uh, we have observed uh, in the Romane horse uh, something for mineralization style that could represent the incipient stage or the potential analog to what uh, the Merlin deposit is, but not to the scale and size, uh, where we can have here the sedimentary rocks, and we can start to see a selective uh, molybdenite replacement of some of these uh, metasserine sedimentary bed, overprinting this albitize and then sericitize uh, uh, sedimentary unit. And then uh, the formation of iron poor uh, gold, uh, gold cobalt, uh, gold co copper gold cobalt mineralization that is also progressively emerging as mineralization styles in some of the uh, metasomatic iron and alkali calcic uh, uh, district. Uh, the Tick Hill deposit, uh, this uh, was a, a very high grade gold resources that was mined. Uh, in time, it's uh, contemporaneous uh, with the IUCG deposits of the Kankiri district. It's also overprinting uh, the sodic alteration characteristic of the district. But in this case, there is very little iron, uh, iron rich minerals uh, directly associated or especially associated with mineralization. Another example uh, from Australia, but in this case, more polymetallic, uh, again within 20 kilometers of another IUCG deposit 
in this case, uh, so uh, quite altered sedimentary units, and then they're overprinted by quartz, quartz carbonate veins, and then it's going to be associated with variable intensity of cobalt, copper, and gold enrichment uh, uh, as these rocks are progressively mineralized uh, by these uh, carbonate quartz uh, alteration flashes. Uh, on the SPG property, uh, we may have uh, some example of that happening as well, uh, where we have our early zones of sodic alteration, and then we are getting progressively overprinted and replaced uh, by uh, this carbonate quartz alteration assemblage. And then this is associated with gold and also gold cobalt mineralization, uh, overprinting the sedimentary unit. And the uh, all wind uh, prospect uh, can also potentially be another one of these uh, low iron uh, style of mineralization where we have a calcopyrite and a gold in association with quartz carbonate uh, replacement and veining uh, inside the sedimentary units. And now what's happening as well is that in many of these metasomatic iron and alkaline calcic alteration system is uh, there's gonna be uh, the special overlap uh, of multiple alteration fasces. And then once these are overlapping, then this can create a very complex and diversified uh, metal association. And a good example of that, uh, that we have in Canada is what's happening uh, inside the nickel deposit. And also what can happen as well is that certain corridors are gonna see the development and preferen preferential development of certain alteration fasces. And then other corridors will see the development of others. So for example, here we have the nickel deposit, which is enriched in uh, tungsten, gold, cobalt, bismuth, copper, uh, associated with high temperature calcic iron, potassium, and high temperature potassium iron alteration. And then in the southern breccia, we have the uh, other, other type of high temperature potassium iron alteration, but in this case, associated with uranium. So also, uh, we can have uh, in distinct corridors, a different style of metal enrichment uh, that happens. Uh, so what we can get from that is that because these systems are evolving, uh, the fluid is evolving, uh, the source, the composition of the source might be evolving as well. Then we can have discrete periods of metal enrichment uh, as these systems are being formed. And then the special overlap of all these styles of alteration are going to create the uh, complex um, metal signatures that we can see in some of these deposits. Uh, it's important to dis discriminate and dis uh, recognize uh, when these metals are enriched because this can really help uh, to guide our exploration to understand how these systems are, are evolving and what, what will be uh, the main type of metals we can anticipate in these zones of mineralization. Uh, an advantage of that as well is that if we have metals that are getting pre-concentrated in certain alteration fasces and they get overprinted, then they can be available for remobilization and reconcentration by subsequent alteration uh, that is superimposed over older alteration zones. And then we can also anticipate some metal zonation as well as not these uh, alteration fasces, uh, they may not completely specially overlap. So certain zones, uh, in this case, might be richer in tungsten, others might be richer in gold, this with cobalt, with little copper, and then as the IUCG uh, overprint evolve, uh, uh, gets more mature, then the copper component may become more important. And then also, if we move away from that, then suddenly we can be in the uranium molybdenum mineralization posted in albitite. So, uh, the development of multiple alteration fasces and with different uh, metal signature really help to explain why do we have such a diversity in metal assemblage and why sometimes when we look at the system, uh, looking at this, it can look confusing, but the reality is it's because it's formed in multiple pulses and then each of these pulses will contribute uh, their own suite of metals to the overall endowment of the zones of mineralization. So the polyphase aspect is also very important. Um, a simplified representation uh, uh, that helps to uh, frame. So if we have certain alteration fasces, uh, which uh, suite of metals can we anticipate? Uh, so this is illustrating uh, which metals are concentrated uh, at each uh, of these alteration fasces, which one are in known resources, which one are potential commodities in, in the future, and uh, which one are we finding in, certain, in our deposits that we have estimated resources in Canada at this point. Also important to remember is that the uh, iron rich alteration uh, may not just be iron oxides. In certain cases, it's gonna be iron carbonate, iron silicates, iron sulfides. So that's also important because 
there can be a special uh, disconnection between the geophysical anomalies we're getting and where the metals are going to be actually uh, concentrated. So we, are, we always have to keep in mind. And looking at the uh, showings can help to understand uh, what we could anticipate uh, for the, the larger zones of uh, mineralization, what we're going to be dealing with. And also that uh, in certain system, uh, iron might be absent and then uh, mineralization will be associated with the uh, iron poor alteration fasces. And again, these ones will have a complete different signature, in geophysical signature from uh, the typical zones of uh, IUCG uh, rich in iron oxides. Uh, and uh, this is something in progress. So we're trying to uh, now put a framework on all this and develop a deposit classification system. Uh, this is, will be a component of the uh, TGI-6 program of the Geological Survey of Canada. So trying to frame uh, all these different styles of mineralization and classes of uh, deposits so that we can become more efficient at navigating at uh, this diversity uh, and then uh, associating certain class of, of deposit with known styles of mineralization uh, and known names of uh, deposit like IOCG deposit or iron oxide appetite deposits. Uh, again, uh, some publicity uh, for the special paper uh, from, from the GAC. So uh, a lot of what has been discussed uh, in this presentation uh, will be explicit in much more detail uh, in that special volume that should come out uh, this fall. So I would like to, to thank you uh, for assisting uh, to this presentation. All right. Well, thanks a lot, GF. That was that was excellent. I certainly learned a lot. <laughs> so I think we're we've got some questions coming in. I, I have a I have a few, but let's see. So Wesley uh, Wesley's asking: Has anyone uh, looked at the fertility of the leached country rock versus an enriched fluid as a controlling factor for the mineralization type, grade, and overall mineral endowment seen in these systems? Pretty, pretty loaded question. <laughs> yeah, that there's multiple uh, answers to that question. So uh, some of it, I can say, I think the country rock could have uh, some impact on the signatures of some of these mineral deposits. Uh, an example that we see is that very often cobalt-rich deposits are going to be in sedimentary sequence. Uh, so the geological environment and the rock, the, the rock sequence that is interacting uh, with these fluids is going to have a control or some control on the overall metal assemblages. But also another very important control is uh, the batholith, what type of fluids uh, the batholiths are exalting. And uh, at different stage, as the geodynamic setting changes, uh, the composition of the magmas forming the batholith will change as well. And as we see in porphyry system and different scarns, if we have intrusions of different compositions, then we may have contribution of fluids uh, with different metal assemblages. And now all these new fluids are going to contribute to the overall uh, metasomatic system and start adding their imprint uh, on the, the, the mineralization that are being formed. Uh, we're sitting at the frontier of knowledge uh, right now on this. Uh, uh, this work needs to be done uh, in more detail. So Ed, Ed is wondering whether you see any similarities of MIACs to the systems in the Athabasca Basin hosting your uranium deposits. There might be, it could be under a continuum, like a geological continuum. We know that a lot of systems we're looking at are actually continuum and they transition one to the other. Uh, there's also, I think it's the work of Erin at Alaska uh, in Nova Scotia that is start now to document north of the Athabasca Basin some uh, albitite uh, and albitite also uranium mineralization. So eventually uh, we could be able to establish uh, the continuum uh, between uh, some of these systems and what the uranium deposit of the Athabasca Basins are. But right now it's difficult to answer that question completely. And di di diachronically, if we look at the evolution of uh, metasomatic iron and alkali calcic activity around the mar margin of Laurentia, what we can see is that there might be a di diachronic evolution uh, of that activity uh, that goes from the Romane horse and the southern province. And then the last step of that would be the Athabasca Basin. Okay. 
So maybe a bit related to that, I was wondering, um, so yeah, you've, you've described all these different facies, a lot of a lot of different metal assemblages can be occurring that, you know, seem to be genetically uh, uh, related to each other. Um, now, in so some cases, like the nickel deposit, I understand that they, you know, you actually see the evidence of overprinting and you see the different uh, zonation and in, in the metal assemblages and alteration assemblages. So you can develop this story quite well there. But then in some of the other deposits that you were showing, you only see one, one or two of those facies. Um, so I'm wondering in those cases, like, you know, what is the evidence that they are in fact related to this MIAC, you know, family? And um, um, because, you know, some of it might look very similar to orogenic gold systems, like some of the iron sulfide, iron silicate, gold assemblages. I mean, if you just look at that facies, it, it could be very similar to an orogenic gold system, right? So is there any fluid inclusion evidence or stabilized top or, or something like that, that that can tell you uh, for sure that it's not an orogenic or some other system? Well, very often what's going to happen is that these zones of mineralization will be associated with very large corridors of sodic alteration or sodic calcic alteration. <clears throat> so there's going to be a special overlap between uh, styles of mineralization and very extensive alkali alteration. Uh, often as well, what could happen is that once you have this orogenic gold mineralization adjacent to it, you may have an orogenic cobalt gold mineralization. And then just nearby, it, you may have an orogenic or an iron formation. Uh, so what's going to happen as well is very often when you have these districts, there's going to be in, in, in all the showings, a lot of different metals that are going to be concentrated. And this is why many of these systems are being missed as well, uh, because a lot of these showings are getting assigned a very specific name and deposit model. But then once you take them as a whole, uh, you start realizing that they're actually all part and components of the uh, same system. So there's different signs, uh, and then the age as well. Uh, so you can probably have uh, some constraint on the age. Uh, and obviously, some of these systems can be remobilized, and the orogenic component can overprint uh, that. We, we see that in some of these uh, Mayak systems. But uh, okay. yeah, that's. Uh, and then maybe kind of specifically on the southern province. So again, we have hundreds of kilometers of of, uh, of showings all over the place that seem to be related to the same solid process. And um, do we know what drives the hydrothermal system there? So do we know what uh, basalt or, you know, what plut plutonism has, has uh, you know, been the fluid, uh, the heat source for these, for these fluids there? Or? Yeah, yeah, there's some answer in the original geology of the southern province. Uh, I guess we can uh, take this. Uh, can you can you see the screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the southern province, uh, we have a significant thermal uh, event, uh, the uh, granitic intrusion, and then the uh, Yapavai orogeny. And then with the uh, granitic intrusion, we have the uh, Killarney granitic suites, which is dated approximately the same age of the sodic alteration uh, inside the southern province. And then we have a full suite of other intrusions that are present uh, in the southern province that can also be contributed to heat and uh, fluids uh, in the geological uh, province. Uh, something else as well that is challenging is that part of the southern province is now remobilized within the Grenville orogeny, and we're missing part of the answer as well because the Grenvillian uh, metamorphism and the transposition of the part of the units may have cut off some of the uh, heat driver uh, of the, the system inside the southern province. Nice. Um, I'm looking for. Uh... Dan, would you maybe want to unmute and then you can ask your question in person? That might be easier than uh, me trying to moderate it. Let's see. Or I can just go ahead and, uh, and ask it. So he's wondering, well, he, he was saying the talk was amazing. And he was wondering mm -hmm. about the Michelin IOCG. There's no iron, no oxide, no copper, no gold. 
so why yeah. is it Exa exactly Michelin is not an IUCG it's an IU IOU uh, so it's an iron oxide uranium, and then there's a full suite of other mineral assemblages that are associated with uranium. Uh, okay, thank common... you very much. Thank you very much to my mind now. <laughs> we may actually be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so JF, we met a few years ago, and it's been a pleasure. Um, the whole ride, unbelievable talk, um, brilliant geoscientist you are. Um, so you probably met me before we met face to face then, right? Because you know where I did my masters. At Michigan. Have, have you met? Have you read my master's thesis? No, I haven't actually. I should probably. Yeah, it was on the uranium metallogeny of the central mineral belt. Just so you know. So I'm very familiar. I was the first person to map the Moran the Moran deposits, and one of the first people to work on Michelin. So I do, I do have a little bit of history, just so you, mm -hmm. um, just so you know. So, um, so I got. I'm going to leave the Michelin because it was just more of a joke than anything else. So, um, <laughs> so one of my questions with IOCG, which I would appreciate because you know a lot more about this than I do, um, is, um, are we, are we mixing different deposit types? For example, Louise likes to put. Thalabora as an IOCG, when I think it's clearly a carbonatite. So where does one deposit leave and another deposit begin? And is that not maybe the problem with IOCG for well, many I, of the I, deposits that you referred to? I think the def definition that, that was proposed, like uh, when it has to have economic copper, a certain amount of iron oxides, uh, structurally controlled hydrothermal, uh, we should probably keep that as the definition of what is IUCG mineralization. But then that being said, then there's a full other suite of mineral deposits that can be formed within these hydrothermal systems uh, that are not IUCG, but can also be uh, significant. Now, something like Parobora, where it's a carbonatite, it's kind of sitting at the fringe. Is it an intrusion-related deposit or is it is it part of a much larger metasomatic system? I think part, part of answering this question would be to look at the context, like how large is the metasomatic system around something like Palobora? And is it just a discrete event or can we follow a trace of many other comparable mineral, mineralization event uh, on a much larger belt? And this could help to resolve a part of that ambiguity. Like a distal, for example, a distal scarn which you would have at a place like Bingham. I mean, the footprint of Bingham is huge. It's about 50 kilometers wide, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> that's related to the Bingham intrusion. So it may be a distal, um, low temperature, epizonal type of mineralization, but it's part of a porphyry system, which is much different from a low temperature replacement deposit that's got nothing to do with a large porphyry type center. So therefore, how do you, like, don't you think it's important to be able to discriminate like truly one deposit as being an isolated deposit type from a deposit which is just part of a zonation of a bigger de depot center, let's say, especially from the point of view of an exploration geologist, or maybe it's not even possible to recognize them, which is also important. Mm -hmm. well, there's a possibility, I mean, Right now, I think what we're trying to establish is really putting together a framework to help like discriminate and really start to bring, bring back the order in, in all of these, these deposits and say, okay, so this is one, this is not, and putting the framework together is going to help to uh, better ascertain what is what and what, what is not one of those. And then with this after, we'll be, we'll be in better shape to, to make a to explore within these, these hydrothermal system and actually classify these mineralization properly as well, which is important uh, so that we, we are all talking about the same thing and we are yeah. all looking for the same thing as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. Amazing, amazing talk, incredible summary of lots of very valuable information. Thanks, Dan. 
Yeah, so I have one more question just following up on the expiration aspect of, of it all. Like, um, so because you said these belts can be hundreds of kilometers extensive, right? Even the southern province. And we see showings and, and, and little sniffs all over the place. Now, is, do you have any insight in what can focus the fluids or what can channel the fluids sufficiently enough? What can be good trap environments where, you know, where we can actually form large deposits? Yeah, well, it's probably the same as many other deposits. So intersection of major structural corridors are probably a good place to look. Uh, having uh, chemical heterogeneities in a geological sequence is also good. So having units that are very compositionally different from the rest. Uh, structural traps like folds or uh, features like that are also uh, potential significance. Uh, it depends on the type of deposit as well, when they are being formed and under which uh, stress regime they are being formed. Uh, something we're observing is that there's potentially a transition between more compressive type of deposits, whereas others will be more extensionals as well. So this could also uh, define uh, somewhat uh, the, the structural context and where the, these things are going to get trapped uh, in the crust. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of mineral system, uh, I think what works for a lot of mineral system can work for these, these types of deposits. Okay, so and then in proximity to the source basalith, I mean, you probably don't usually know where the basalith is that has driven these systems, right? Or, well, in certain cases, you know where the basalith is, but you can be 30, uh, 40 kilometers away from the basalith and still form significant deposits. Uh, the basalith is important because it's the heat driver, uh, but uh, the fluids are going much further away than where the basalith is. Yeah, so Bruno, Bruno is following up on that. Is uh, you know, is there a preferred tectonic setting for the formation of these these deposits? Well, this is something we'll have to establish. Uh, right now, uh, we don't know. What we know, uh, IUCG tends to sit at the transition between compression to extension. Uh, but for all these other styles, uh, we'll probably need to. We have some work to do. And as far as I can answer right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's, there's definitely lots, lots to do here, but yeah, it's amazing. Okay, so yeah, I'm, so, I'm wondering if there's more questions coming in, but if not, um, yeah, thanks again for JF. This, this was an amazing talk that you put together sort of in your free time when you're not VP exploration of Red Pine and the <laughs> chief geo of McDonald Mines. So you know, excellent that you can continue uh, your research with, with the GSC. And so congratulations on all these results and you know good luck with the research and also with the with the exploration on the on the properties. And uh, yeah thank you everyone for uh, uh, for joining today. Uh, and um, yeah see you all next year. Actually, there's there's one more question. Uh, no, that's not that's not directed to you. So, um, yeah. Again, thanks, JF, for uh, for the talk. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Well, thank thank you very much for the opportunity as well. This is very appreciated.